Welcome to Exploring the Ethnogothic. I'm Dr. Eric Wesselman. And I'm Dr. Sanford Carpenter. In this series, we explore the intersection between horror, race, social identity, and culture. For today's special guest, we are joined by Mr. David Walker, award-winning comic book writer, author, filmmaker, journalist, and educator, specializing in multiple genres. He has taught at various institutions of higher education, such as Portland State University, and the Pacific Northwest College of Art. Mr. Walker, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. And it's really good to have you. Um, I, I, I wanted to start off with, with, with kind of a simple question. because One of the things we really want to talk about is bitter root, right? Mm -hmm. um, tell, could you just tell us, what, was, what were the initial thoughts around bitter root? What was the elevator pitch for this? Um, well, you know, bitter root is, it's myself. Uh, Sanford Green and, and Chuck Brown, and they had been developing it over the course of quite some time before I came on board. And their pitch was, it's about, it's, it's about a family of monster hunters during the Harlem Renaissance, and they were trained by Harriet Tubman. And I was like, okay, so they were trained by Harriet Tubman before the Harlem Renaissance, right? That's what we're <laughs> getting at. But that was it. It was just, um, it was about a family of monster hunters set during the Harlem Renaissance. That was, that was the initial the initial idea and then when I came on board you know I started asking questions as as I mapped to do and and was like okay well you know what does Harriet Tubman have to do with it and and you know Chuck and Sanford were like oh it'd be really cool if you know if the Underground Railroad had to fight monsters and I was like okay yeah no that is a cool idea now the the one thing I'll have to add is that um, before Bitter Root was able to get up and off the ground completely, before we were able to get our first issue out, a guy named David Crownson put out a, a comic called Harry Tubman Demon Slayer. And, and so we had to pull back on that whole concept. Um, but what, what that did to me, or what that did for me, is it, it caused me to ask the question of Sanford and Chuck, well, if... If, mem if people within the Underground Railroad were fighting monsters, what does slavery have to do with, you know, with all of it? And, and their response was, well, nothing. And I was like, well, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> and if there's no such thing as, as a bad answer, this would be the, the exception to the rule. And, and I said, well, it seems to me like, you know, we have an opportunity to explore the, the I, you know, some of the ideas surrounding slavery, but also about race and racism in America through this lens of horror. And, and that's what got me really excited, right? Like there's like a, a, a comedy can only be so funny. A horror movie can only be so scary, you know, but it's when you add more to it, right? And it's, and, and the key to adding more to it, at layering it, adding subtext, things like that, those are the things that to me make or break a, a, a film or a comic or a novel. Um, but you have to be careful how you put that in there, right? Like you don't want to bash somebody over the head with what you're trying to do. You, you want some people to come out of the audience going, wow, you know, that, that was a really good movie. And then the other person says, well, you know, I, I love how Texas Chainsaw Massacre was about the erosion of family values and, and it was about the truth of what America is really all about in terms of traditional families. And then the other person's like, oh, I thought it was just about chainsaws, right? Like that's that's where you get that perfect mix. So, and I think I think what's also interesting is um, is the story that, that this does tell, right? Um, in terms of, you know, and one thing I want to focus on is is um, is in terms of telling this story of you know using horror and the Underground Railroad and um, and then also what happened in what happened in Oklahoma using all of these things as a as sort of this backdrop for this story, you know there, there's a really powerful there's a really powerful message about about race and what race is and what it does to people. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, you know, I mean, that was sort of what attracted me to the possibilities of what we could do with Bitter Root is that, you know, in America, racism and, and, and not just racism, but the idea of race and race-like racial identification um, 
racial identification makes monsters out of people. It turns people into monsters, right? And and that's what it's all about, right? The, 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 this, this dehumanization, racism, sexism, um, homophobia, transphobia, it's all about dehumanization. And, but the key is, is that what a lot of people don't understand is that, that, the, that the oppressor, the people who are doing the dehumanization, the only way you can do that is if you give up your humanity as well, right? You have to give up a piece of your humanity to dehumanize somebody else. So I, I thought it would be interesting to, to do an exploration of, you know, what that process does, both to the oppressor and the oppressed. And that's what Bitter Root is about. It's about how hatred and oppression and racism and all those, all those fun things, um, it, it sets out to turn us, the oppressed, into monsters. But in order to do that, you have to become a monster, right? I mean, you look at the history of like the Ku Klux Klan. And, and what were they doing? They were pretending to be ghosts, right? They were pretending to be specters. And, 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 and the, the thing that I always thought was interesting is like when those hoods come off, that's when you see the real monsters, right? Like they're, they're trying to hide their identity. And, and so I think that there's the, the, um, there's the, the monsters that we, that some people allow themselves to become and then there's the monsters that others get turned into. And that's what Bitter Root is really about. It's about the monsters that we get turned into. And we see it all the time, right? We see it whenever somebody gets killed by the police, whether it's a, a George Floyd or, or a Sandra Bland or, or a Breonna Taylor. And it's like, there's this push to make them out to be a bad person. Oh, well, they, you know, this person cheated on their SATs, right? You know, like, or, or, or maybe they, they smoked weed or whatever. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't excuse the fact that you, you killed them and you're trying to justify it. And, and I think that that, that idea of, you know, and, and a lot of this goes back to like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, right? Not, to, I, I'm talking the original book, but then we see it in all the, the film versions too. It's like the man made the monster and the monster didn't want to be a monster. The monster was just like, you know, even even in the versions where he has the bad brain, right? The the, the Abby normal brain. Um, he he wants to the, the monster just wants to to exist, right? And and I think that's one of the interesting things about horror in general is how often it makes a monster out of something that's not a monster, right? Like um Jaws, which I consider to be a, a great horror movie, like the shark ain't the monster. The shark is just an animal that's hungry, right? And and but we as humans place these attributes on the monster or on the on the shark, and 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 I think that's what's fascinating about um, horror movies, you know, and horror stories is how many times the monster is something that we make it out to be a monster, right? Like we ain't got no business out swimming out in the ocean, you know, come on. True, true. And, and I'll say one thing, one thing that, that this also leads into is one of the central dilemmas of, of the story, which is, you know, it focuses on the Sangaree family and there, there, there's two factions or there's two, there's two ideas yeah. about how to deal, how to deal with monsters. And, um, and you know, one is, one is to is to is to kill them. You know, yeah. You know, um, these people, their their hatred transforms them into monsters. We smite them. <laughs> the yeah. other, and, but then the other is we cure them. Right. Um, we we find a way. We find a way to 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 um, to take to take them and transform them back from being monsters into being human beings. Um, and, and in doing that, that I, I think that, that that's the moment in, that's, that's really the moment in this series or, or the element of the series that from my perspective, most decenters whiteness, yeah. you know, yeah. because it takes racism and, and, and really, really takes all the agency for dealing with the problem and all the thinking around the problem. It takes it out of the white subject and puts it in, and puts it in a black community. Um, and it's centering sort of how this black community is processing it with, and with all the, and also with all the trauma that's related to it. Right. Yeah. Um, 
I'd like to I'd like to get some get some thoughts about about um, about how you approach this ideological tension. <laughs> well, you know, it was um, we we had a lot of conversations. We continue to have a lot of conversations about this, um, and and it's this this idea of you know my approach is we have this conflict within the family, right? Like you said, there's the people it's like, do we cure or do we kill? And, and, you know, then the question becomes, well, if you choose to cure, why is it our responsibility to cure a disease that we didn't create, right? We're just the, the, the victims of this disease. And, and do people really want to be cured? And, and, and this is most important. And this is, this is one of the things where the, creatively there's been some conflict within the team is like can you cure it right can you cure this thing and and it's you know as there, there's a film in development and and this is one of the debates that they've been having because they're like you know you can't just make a movie in which you cure a racist you know you give them a shot or you give them a pill right and and i've been saying all along yeah i know that and 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 this is part of what the bigger series is building towards. And, and if we can ever get our act together and do this next story arc, we're going to see that. We're going to see what happens when you rely on this idea that it can be cured, right? And and I think that for me, bitter root is meant to be a metaphor of of everything that's wrong with America in terms of how it deals not just with race, but with identity as a whole, right? And, and that identity includes, um, you know, gender and sexuality and, and religion. And, and like, we could turn around tomorrow and start, restart Bitter Root and have it be all about LGBTQ, period. Because they're the new monsters, right? Like, America has now turned them into, this, in, into some sort of, and like, I, and I'm trying to wrap my head around it, that how they've turned you know, both LGBTQ community and books, just books into monsters, right? And and it's 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 crazy to me that it's easier to ban books than it is to ban guns in this country, right? Like I, I when was the last time any one person walked into a room with a book and killed 20 people with a book? I want to meet that person because that's some John Wick style <laughs> stuff right there, right? You know, <laughs> that is that is straight up John Wickism. If you can, if you can, you know, a mass booking. Yeah, when was the last time we heard about a mass booking? So, um, but I do. I think that that's like like as a, as a country, as a society, because this goes predates even the the actual formation of the United States. This goes back to when we were a colony. Um, we're great at making monsters. We really are. Um, and, 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 and the thing is, the worst part of, of, of all of this is it's not just uh, uh, something that's, that's a problem within white America. Like this habit, this ideology of creating monsters ha is, has affected everybody. Like everybody has monsters, even within their own, you know, their, their, their particular branch of the family tree. And their and their fights that go on and and it's just it's absolutely ludicrous. Yeah, um, it's so much of the rhetoric, right? Seems to be and thinking about the the, the books, for example, right? Is yeah. it's focused on this idea of 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 fear of perceived threat uh, to an individual, to a system, to a worldview, you know, concentrically. Um, and like I, I, I loved earlier when you talked about this idea of making monsters and becoming monsters and how those two are kind of intertwined, right? Yeah. And, um, and there's almost like in a the concept of a quote unquote monster, right? Mm -hmm. Or in the context of burning books, that there's an idea that is somehow threatening. There's an essentialism in the rhetoric that's being used here, right? Someone is a monster 
or they're not, or this idea is dangerous and it's going to somehow change something that's going to violate the essential category or whatever that the system is based on. And um, I guess I'm just curious what sort of, uh, if anything that I've said there kind of resonates with, with, with your perspective. Yeah, I mean, man, it's it's early here, so I'm still <laughs> my brain's still getting firing. But I, I think that um, uh, I'm having. A, I'm sorry because I'm having a brain fart right now. But everything you're saying makes sense to me. So somewhere deep in the cerebral cortex, it's like, yeah, I do agree with this. <laughs> I just have to come up with the right words. Um, no, I just I think that it's again, it's it's um, there's there's look, the, the creation of monsters, you know, goes back to, you know, before recorded civilization, right? Um, the, the formation of myths and legends, and, and we use monsters as a way to um, conceptualize our fear, right? The things that we're afraid of. And, and, and then we can defeat those monsters, right? But the problem is, is what happens when the thing you're afraid of is another person and you're afraid of them based on the color of their skin or, or their religion or whatever. And, and, you know, and so there's this really fascinating shift in, in American horror, especially American horror films, where, you know, in the, in the fifties, like, horror films were all about the fear of communism and the spread of communism. Um, and you saw that in sci-fi and you saw that in horror. Um, but then you've got like, then it shifts and suddenly the horror is about something else, right? And you see that shift it's very significantly in, um, you know, in, there's a couple of movies within the sixties that you see it and Psycho is one of them, right? Where, where the shift is suddenly about the threat next door, right? Yeah. And and it's about this this like how easily evil can hide amongst us, and it, it's it's not about communism, right? Um, and and you know, and I I happen to disagree with the people who who, who take the Freudian approach to Psycho, and you know, go oh, it's and the knife is a penis, and da da da, da. Well, no, 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 none of that. Um, but then you see that I think especially like in, in Night of the Living Dead, where suddenly the horror is is really it's it's about um society, uh, it's about the human I side of it all. It's not about again communism, you know, or the or the fear of the bomb. You know, you, you watch movies like them and 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 invasion of the body snatchers and all those classics, and it's pretty clear what they're talking about. Right. And suddenly it's like it's there, there's that moment that horror became the person who lives next door it mm -hmm. became about your neighbor if i may riff off because you mentioned psycho for example and another film that came out contemporary maybe slightly before is is uh, michael powell's peeping tom yes uh and what i've always found fascinating about those two is that they're both dealing with a person, the, the danger from the person next door, someone that we might, we certainly would argue their actions are monstrous, but the way they're treated, at least in terms of the narrative structure, right? Psycho, we don't know, cultural knowledge notwithstanding, we yeah, don't yeah. know until the end that, that he is the killer. Yeah. Um, so he's the sympathetic character the entire time. Um, and so we're shocked, we're surprised with that reveal. With uh, the character, um, of Mark in Peeping Tom, we know from the get-go that he is the killer, but he's yeah. also shown in such a sympathetic light that I think my reading of it is one of the reasons why people had such a hard time with that film was this tension between monster and human, right? Yeah. It makes it so much easier to dehumanize if to, to sort of, if we want to build the concept of a monster, you know, if we can deny all of the complexity and the sympathy, it makes it so much easier. Right. Yeah. So to sit there with that tension is a lot harder. And 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 we as again as a society, American society is really good at, at making monsters. You know, you you look at all the history that's been written about, you know, the indigenous population and 
they're they're the savages they're the animals they're the they're the bloodthirsty killers that's making monsters right you, you look at the the history of of slavery in this um, in this country and and the thing that's interesting about slavery was it was it was built on this notion of inferiority right and it was it was taking people of african descent and it was making them less than human it was chattel right they were cows and pigs basically and and when and when that became against the law and you couldn't you could no longer make them you know dogs or cats or whatever you know property they went from being animals to being monsters they went they went from being uh loyal servants to dangerous threats and 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 to me that that the exploration of all of that is what is, is like if you're not trying to do that with your horror films or your horror comics or your horror novels if you're not trying to do that then you're kind of wasting everybody's time and 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 equally you're wasting people's time if you're hammering them over the head with it right like you want it again this goes back to what i said earlier you want you want your your stories to exist on uh on two levels right there's that level that that's just like the the more base visceral like oh this is scary i can't watch this or you know i i always go back to when when my cousin and i were watching um the 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 first the original texas chainsaw massacre which is is in my top five horror movies of all time right and we were pretty young you know we're watching on vhs and there's this line where where drayton sawyer the cook comes home and Leatherface has sawed the, the, the front door and he goes, look what your brother did to the door. Ain't you got no pride in your home? And it was like, that's what this movie is really about. This movie is about this family that thinks they're normal. They think that this, that everything they are saying is saying and doing is okay. And it's about the disruption of that, that, that normalcy. Right. And, and to me, like and it's about maintaining it at any cost, right? Like, like if the, the and you know this is how nerdy I am when it comes to horror. Like the the, the family is the the Sawyer family. There's there's Drayton is the cook and Bubba is is Leatherface and the hitchhiker. And it's like if if that movie if they if they made that movie today, which they are constantly remaking it, but they'd all be walking around with Make America Great shirts on and hats right because they're they are they are what MAGA Republicans are they're they're they think there's that that they're perfectly normal they're chopping people up and eating them and and to them that's perfectly normal the rest of us are looking around like going oh my god um and and it's it's interesting because yeah we've hit this point where like we I see you know, we see it in the news just about every day, right? You know, every you know, well, I shouldn't say every, but the vast majority of all the the mass shootings that go on in this country is 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 someone they're they they are monsters, but they think the others are monsters, right? And and we see them, you know, again when they're when they're targeting whether it's immigrants or whether it's you know drag queens or whatever, it's like. Like, what is wrong with you? And 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 if we as creators can't find a way to mine that and turn that into something, then 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 we're failing. And we are. And a lot of us are failing. Or a lot. Uh, you know, uh, most of the movies I see these days. I was I was saying to someone the other day. I haven't watched a contemporary horror movie in a long time. And you know, um, I honestly you know get out might have been the last one i mean i've seen nope and i've seen us so i've seen jordan peele's three movies um but most of this other stuff you know the the what i can't even think of what they're called insidious and and her and and her was it heredity or i don't like most of the stuff i'm not even watching it's just like i just don't i can turn on the news to be terrified you know and and get out was i found get out to be profoundly disturbing but the last movie i saw that i think actually scared me was was the ring both the the uh original japanese version and the american remake 
Japanese version is a little bit scarier. But when she comes out of the TV, you know, I, I oh no, 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 I, I don't know if I can, you know, handle this. And and to me, like like and Japanese horror and Korean horror is very different than a lot of American horror, right? Because like most of those films are are actually dealing with the supernatural, are dealing with monsters, true monsters, things that we can't explain. Whereas a lot of American horror has gone the route of turning you know whatever you know whether even even jason Voorhees in, in the friday the 13th movies or beforehand is like yeah okay he may be a demon he may not be a demon but it's like it's turning a monster into this kid who became a monster because the camp counselors weren't responsible whatever you know so but what is it i mean what I think is really interesting is, is even in this conversation, you keep coming back to what scares you. You keep coming back to monsters. Um, you know, I'd like to get you to, to kind of respond a little deeper to, um, to like the genre question here, which is um, what is it about the horror genre? You know, uh, Bitterroot, what's interesting is it kind of combines the horror genre with the adventure and the superhero genre. Yeah. But it's still ultimately like, like what's strongest is the horror elements. So what is it about, what is it about horror that allows it to work so well with dealing with issues of identity and trauma and, and race? Um, I, well, I think because so many of those things, whether it's race or, or, or identity, sexuality, all that stuff, there's, even if it's, it, it might not be horrific, but there's, elements that make it horrific right there's ele elements that make being a black person in america absolutely terrifying right and and anyone who says that it's not an absolutely terrifying experience has lived a very sheltered life now it's not to say it's terrifying all the time everywhere you go but it's like i i know there's parts of this country there's parts of the city that i live in that i i i, I wouldn't be the smartest to go there it definitely wouldn't be smart to go there after dark you know um and 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 because we, we we live in a time where you can knock on somebody's door and get shot right you're you're a black kid going to pick up your siblings from a birthday party you go to the wrong house you knock on the door and someone shoots you right and you can be a white girl in a car turning around in somebody's driveway and they come out and shoot you there like there is nothing scarier than that, right? Because it, you know, forget communism, forget the bomb, forget aliens from another planet. When you can't knock on somebody's door and ask for directions or or turn your car around, and that there's so many things that can terrify us, and I think horror um, allows us to. In a, in a superficial way, conquer those fears, right? We, we live vicariously through the moment, right? You know, it's, it's, it's why a film like Get Out resonated so much with so many people because there's so many of us that were like, oh yeah, no, this is what it's like, you know? <laughs> the, the, even that opening scene with Lakeith Stanfield when he's walking through the neighborhood and, and it was like, my first thought was like, what is he doing there? Just, no, just, just get out. You know, like that's what I was thinking. And so many people and, and you felt that on two levels, right? Like like white audiences felt it like because of the way Jordan Peele constructed the scene, it has a tense, uh, you know, attention to it. Right. Um, but for black audiences, it was something else like we've been there before. We've experienced some of this before. And 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 and, and I use that I'll use, to continue on with that movie. You know, it's like um, there's there's this th that scene near the beginning when they're when um, they're pulled over in the car and and the cop wants to see his ID and the girlfriend's like you don't need to see his ID he wasn't driving did it and you know she's doing that what we think is that liberal sort of standing up for her boyfriend and meanwhile as black folks were kind of cringing as we're watching it because we're like. Yeah, you, you might be making this worse for the man, right? Like, yeah. uh, you know, um, and, and, but then 
you've watched the movie, it's over. And then you start to realize, oh no, the reason she was doing that was because she didn't want any trace of, of, of this guy. She didn't want the cops knowing he was there. So suddenly the horror takes on a whole other level, right? It's, it's not just the horror of um, your white girlfriend is mouthing off to the cops and the cops may just shoot you for no reason. They were gonna shoot you anyway. Now they might shoot you because this this liberal me leaning seemingly liberal woman is 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 mouthing off, um, and that's what horror is, right? Horror allows us to, um, when it's done well, it allows us to stare into the thing that terrifies us the most, even if we don't realize that that's what's terrifying us the most, right? Um, and 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 we'll walk out of the theater sometimes and go, or or turn off Netflix or turn off our Blu-ray player or whatever it is and go, what was it about that that just really just got me right? And 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 sometimes you you can spend a lifetime not quite understanding why why it scared you so much. Like a jump scare is one thing, right? Like, uh, you know, but there's a reason why rosemary's baby is so damn terrifying you know and it's 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 that it's this metaphor for a lot of things but primarily about the uncertainty of what it means to be a parent right and 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 having no con having almost no control over your body and and i mean that's a it's a body horror story but it's also a ho the horror of community what happens when the community around you is so toxic that it it leads to having the, you know a, a demonic child. I don't know if that answered your question, Stan. Oh, oh, it certainly does. It certainly okay. does. <laughs> I was taking that all in right now because there's, you know, just you, for example, you leaving with Rosemary's Baby, right? There's there's so many layers of of ways that you can be unsettled. Right. Yeah. And, and the um, the sort of horror art artists who do it well seem to be able to play each of these levels like an instrument to, to create this symphony. Right. Because there are the, the, the body horror, the knee jerk disgust elements. Yeah. Um, there are also the. Uh, that middle level tension of, for example, am I losing my mind? Am I not? Are these people really out to get me and to sacrifice my kid? Or at the end, the recognition that, well, actually, maybe my kid is evil. Maybe yeah. now, what does yeah. that mean? Right? I'm a, a parent to this child, but this child is also supposed to be the embodiment of evil, right? Which can also then lead into this sort of larger existential dread, right? And an audience member can move through all of them uh, different times or hold them together. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I definitely, I, 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 I again, and I can't, I, I mean, I've cut back on the amount of movies I watch these days and I tend to just go back to things that I like that I've seen before. Right. Because they, they, they work and I don't want to, you know, there, there's, you hit an age you know, especially I'll say this to, to all you young folks out there. Um, <laughs> you hit an age where it's like the thought of wasting your time with a movie is it, it, there's there's almost nothing worse. You know, you hit like your mid 40s or something and it's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not giving another minute of my life to a Transformers movie because I'm never going to get that time back. Right. And I'd be better served trying to get the mildew stains out of my shower than I would you know, watching, watching this sort of, uh, insipid trash. Um, and, and with horror, it's just, you know, I, I feel like as a, as a creative person, I've sort of hit a, a phase where it almost feels like my lack of interest in, in not just horror, but in a lot of things is, is coming from the fact that it's like, oh, I'm, you're not showing me anything I haven't seen already. And, and if you're going to show me something that I've seen already, at least dress it up slightly differently, right? Which is um, part of the reason why, you know, again, going back to Jordan Peele, I absolutely loved Get Out and I absolutely loved Nope. Us, I'm still sort of, I liked it, but I didn't love it, right? And, and but I, I 
that's one of those few films where I'm willing to watch it multiple times to let it seep in. But when, you know, like when I saw a note, it gave me something because uh, that's his mo most recent film. It gave me like, oh, I, uh, yeah, I didn't know I wanted this. Right. I like like I didn't know what I was looking for in a you know, I think that movie more was a thriller than than, than straight up horror. But it was like, oh, oh, yeah. OK, yeah. No, you're giving me you give me something I wanted. I didn't know I wanted this. Um, and 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 it made me want more, but I wasn't disappointed that I didn't get more, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And and that's um, before we started recording, you know, Stanford was talking about prequels and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. like, that's one of the things I don't want, right? Like, like I I I, I talked about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, the original 74 version, and then the 86 sequel. Like I, I love both of those movies all the sequels and all the prequels, I didn't need them. I don't need to know how Leatherface became Leatherface. There's there's actually nothing scary about showing me that. Just like I didn't need to see how Darth Vader became Darth Vader. Like mm -hmm. he arrived scary. And, mm -hmm. and and unless you're going to do an incredible job and it's it's so hard to do. And I especially think it's hard to do in in, in horror films, right? Where it's like we're gonna show you how the evil became evil. It's like, ah, uh, you know, no, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't do that to me. Because, because if you don't do it right, you know, then, then you're stuck with, you know, whatever, like Friday the Thirteenth, the New Beginnings, or that. Although that wasn't a prequel, so I'm just throwing that one out. But, but you know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? So well, it's it's interesting because. Um, because what you're also tapping into is what direction you want to look, right? Yeah. Um, this came up in, in one of our other interviews of um, horror is very much in the moment. Horror is very much about the present, yeah. um, whereas fantasy is, is very much about the past and science fiction is about, uh, you know, sci-fi is really about, is, is about the future. Now they still have elements of past, present, and future. And especially yeah. when when you start getting into, uh, into um, african-american constructions and you know you start getting it's like sankofa right where where it's like you know where you 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 reach back to get to to move forward you know so there's yeah. these cyclical elements but in in all of this it's um what i feel you're describing is um is that a present that looks you know that you can do all of these things with a present that goes forward without getting caught up in the past, right? Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, cause cause as you're talking about, you don't want to see how evil became evil, but we just we recently had a black horror film that was very much about how evil became evil, but it did it by looking forward. And I would say that would be Nia DaCosta's Candyman. Okay. Which I still haven't seen that one yet. So yeah. Because what it is 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 we see who becomes the next candyman by the very yeah. end. And by, by seeing who becomes the next Candyman, we have insights into how the first Candyman was created, but we didn't have to do a prequel to get there. Yeah. Um, and and so, so I find that to be really interesting in terms of how you're expressing what connects to you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm also, another thing that I'm also hearing is, um, is that for you, it's, it's also very much about world building, right? Like, like yeah. when you were talking about about Get Out, Us, and Nope, one of the real distinctions between those three is that um, the world that that um, Get Out is based on is a world that we're very familiar with. We understand the rules of. It's yeah. this world where you step into these toxic environments. Um, the world of Nope is also our every is also very much like our world. We very much understand it. It's this world where you go about life as best you can, and all of a sudden something drops from the sky and smites you. Yeah. Right. Whereas us is kind of you know that middle one, right? There's a, there's a complexity to that world building, like what's going on underground, right? Yeah. Like it it doesn't connect with our everyday world in the same way, and I find that to be really really interesting. Yeah. No, and I think that there's, I mean, it, it, it's it's interesting because I had a conversation with somebody, I, I'm not going to name them, but it's another creator. 
and I was talking about horror and, and, you know, and we were sort of having a conversation about how do we create what we create, right? And, and I said, well, you know, what are, like, what are your favorite horror movies? And they said, oh, well, you know, like, I really love the Saw films and da, 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 da. And I just was like, and this is why you suck as a creative, right? Like, like <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, but I kind of thought that. I was, you know, but I was like, okay, first of all, you should be looking at, you know, nothing that was made within the last 20 years, right? You should be going back to silent films and the, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, but you should also be looking at the world, like, like what's truly terrifying. And, and, you know, again, that's why, why Get Out works. Get Out is, I, I just got invited to a barbecue a couple of days ago. It's, it's, it's coming up. And, and, um, and I was like, yeah, there's too many white people going to this thing. I was like, yeah, the last time I was at a, at a barbecue with a lot of white people, it went late into the night and they brought out guns and they started shooting up into the sky. And I was like, yeah, I ain't doing this no more. You know, I'm not going anywhere <laughs> in the woods with fire guns. And like, this is not like, that was terrifying to me. Right. And, and that's the thing. We all have the things that we're afraid of how do we, you know, how do we conquer those fears? And, and, and again, I think that's what the horror genre is all about. It's about showing us how we conquer. Like, I'm not afraid of zombies, right? I, I love a good zombie story. I love Romero zombie movies. Um, and, and for someone who loves zombies as much as I do, I, I don't like most zombie films. Um, but they don't terrify me like they did when I was a kid because I live in a country full of zombies, right? Like that's what, that's what terrifies me, right? When I, when I look at the, the January 6th insur insurrection, that's what terrifies me, right? And that right there is whether you consider 28 Days Later to be a zombie movie or not, zombie adjacent, you know, Dawn of the Dead, even the first evil or not evil dead movie resident evil which you know whatever we don't even need to get into intricacies of that um but it's like oh, i'm watching this like live i was watching it live on cnn like there's nothing more terrifying than 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 that like no horror movie can top that but if you're trying to make something horrific that's what you should be looking at right you should be looking at Ron DeSantis. Like Ron DeSantis is the ultimate mad scientist in a horror movie. Like he is convinced that there's monsters everywhere. And the only way to destroy those monsters is to become an even bigger monster. That man is, you know, and Donald Trump, same thing, not to make this about politics, but like it's, it's interesting how much you know, I don't know if art imitates life or life imitates art, you know, but there's this cycle and we're, we're, we're in it now where it's like, there's days where I, I feel like Macaulay Culkin and Home Alone, where I'm just like, yeah. like, I can't believe what I'm seeing, you know? So I, I, David, I love that, that point you make about cycle, because where I keep cycling back in our conversation is you let you know you said you like to rewatch your favorite horror films right and mm -hmm. you're recommending uh to other writers to watch older films and when we rewatch a film right we get something different usually i mean you mentioned for example get out right and that that moment at the in the traffic stop a viewer experiences it differently having known the ending right yeah. same thing with um psycho right when we watch it a second time we now experience every interaction that <laughs> someone has with uh you know norman in a different yeah. way um but there, so so that happens as an individual just as we we age right like yeah. i see films now that terrify me in a completely different way what involves families when i was a kid i was scared of one thing now that i have kids i'm scared at the family level yeah then you have the cultural right so someone who didn't grow up in the 30s and watches dracula now might see things very differently or put something different on that right or like you mentioned night of the living dead and someone who watched it in a different decade may see something different than someone who the first time they watch it is after they saw the january 6th insurrection right yeah. so i'm just 
I'm curious about about this how you think of this this sort of cycle individually and culturally about the, the nature of consuming these narratives it's yeah the cycle is, is actually really interesting because um like it it almost feels like we've hit a point where in this particular iteration of the cycle this particular go round where real life is more outrageous than what we're seeing you know in our filmed entertainment right mm -hmm. and and there's this sort of we've become numbed or anesthetized to some of the ridiculousness of it which is how we've gotten into the situation that we're in right like it's almost like um I, I I was I've never been the sort of person uh especially when I was younger who thought a movie was too violent or too scary or you know whatever um but there's now I'm like oh oh I I I think I see what they're talking about right like like the the like the January 6th insurrection is is the byproduct of of pop culture and mass media and people believing that they can be John Rambo and it's it's it it's so crazy to me because there's there is nothing more terrifying than what we can see in in real life and i think that in this again this particular cycle um and because the cycle is bigger and it's influenced in a lot of other ways right so you know when when i was younger you either went to the movies or you saw something on tv it was the, that was it and you know and then came home video right and and so then you had home video but now you've got you know there's there aren't really that many video stores anymore but you do you still have that media you've got blu-rays you've got dvds and then you've got streaming and then you've got tiktok and then you've got youtube and you have people who can like make their own little horror shorts or maybe even a feature length and put it up on youtube the the accessibility is there now this the skill set the true creative skill set might be lacking and there's people that are making things without like if you're going to make a, a zombie movie and your only frame of reference is the walking dead you got a problem right um but i i think that that the, again that cycle is so different because we've been inundated and oversaturated with so much and now we're we're at a time where it's like you're it's almost like you're hard pressed to be more insane and more terrifying than reality and and that was what you know because i've had this argument before like that's what psycho was about right psycho and I, I will argue with anybody who who throws in the the knife is a penis, you know. It's like no, no, that's not what it is. Psycho is about what really happens, right? You know, Robert Block based the book on the the um, the Wisconsin killings that Ed Gein committed in the grave robbing, and it was it was sort of looking at again the nightmare next door, what's going on in this country, right? And like that, like psycho is so tame now, right? You know, if we if we hear if we were to like we could we could go onto any news thing or onto YouTube right now and probably find a story within the last like three days about someone who dressed up as their mother and killed people. Like, but back then it seemed so shocking. Um, uh, when we think about all the things that have shocked us in in the world of popular entertainment. Um, and within, say, the genre of horror, there's you strip the supernatural elements out of these uh, out of various stories. There's nothing that's more terrifying than what we're seeing right now, right? And and I and I I would go so far as to say it's been that way probably for far longer than we realized. It's just the accessibility of it all now, and and so I think that cycle is very different because because then the question becomes. Well, how can I be more terrifying than a bunch of MAGA Republicans who are, you know, threatening the lives of um, of poll workers or of, you know, um, um, of, of FBI agents? And, and, you know, God knows I'm not, you know, the strongest proponent of law enforcement. But, you know, when, you know, 
50 years ago when the Black Panther Party was talking about going up against the corrupt police, it, that's, it was actually different than what, you know, uh, like some of these MAGA folks are doing. So again, what's interesting about the cycle is, well, how do we, the cycle has always been in the past, how do we top reality? How do we make it more hyper real? How do we layer it and, and come up with something that is more terrifying than real life? And I don't know how we do that now. And something that I've, uh, as you're talking, I've been sort of perseverating on this as I think about the sort of psychology of horror, right? This is still entertainment. Yeah. Right? And so, <laughs> Uh, or should idea, be. <laughs> well, well, so this is hyper real, right? Yeah. As you mentioned. And for me, like I, I really resonate with when you said, why don't I just turn on the TV? Right. Yeah. I don't like my horror to be real. Yeah. If it's going to be based in reality in the sense of like psycho, where there is no supernatural elements, I for me to really enjoy it, there has to be something hyper real, something that provides me a cue that this is still fiction right yeah. so if you if you watch the um the blu-ray they have the shower scene that you can watch without the track and the argument that i think they were trying to make was look how important bernard herman's score was to the yeah. tension of this moment etc and yes and for me i found the shower scene with just diegetic ambient noise much more terrifying yeah. because i'm like am i just watching a, a, you know a snuff film at this point in time there is no cue for me that this is that there's distance here this is why like i don't like true crime i got nothing against it but yeah. for me because i know this is real i am no longer entertained i am just terrified um yeah, so no, I, tr true crime is that's some scary shit when you yeah. start <laughs> You know, like, oh, how did they catch the Green River Killer? And then you're studying about the Green River Killer and you're like, oh, my God, you know? Yeah. Um, no, you're right. That That's interesting. But Psycho in the shower scene is a, excuse me, is a great example because, you know, it's you, not only do you have the music, you've got the music, you've got the, the black and white photography, mm -hmm. and and then you've got the way it's edited and shot. Yes, but, but without the music, suddenly it becomes some some potentially creepy, scary stuff. So uh, more so than than I think um, without the music, and and um, yeah, I I just I don't know. I I part of me feels like as a as a consumer, as a viewer, as an audience member, it's like. Yeah, I do. I, I don't know if I want to be scared right now. Like I have enough other things scaring me. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a creator, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, well, well, within that fear that I'm trying to generate within my readers, within my audience, what hope am I giving them? Because like, I think that that's, you know, and, and maybe you give them no hope at all. I mean, you know, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing ends with no hope, you know, um, a lot of movies, even, you know, there's, there's, I go back to, you know, there's three or four key movies I always go back to, Night of the Living Dead, there's no hope, you know, even Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like, I just remember my cousin and I watching it and watching it, and we looked at each other and she, and we were like, um, yo, the, the, she's, she's never going to be right again. You know, like, like you survived all of this. I, I think the poster said, who will survive and what will become of them? Right. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and that, that's the terror. That's, that's maybe the most terrifying part of, you know, as you're watching that movie and you're going, oh shit, if she lives, mm -hmm. you're not getting over this one. Right. You know, this oh. is, there's, there's, there's no amount of therapy that's going to, that's going to, you know, um, help you there. And, and so I do, I think that, you know, I keep coming back to as a creative person, but also as an audience member, like, what is it that I want? Right. And, and right now more than anything I want is, is a sense of hope. Um, but I can also tell you, like, you know, I, I said, I haven't really watched that many horror movies, but I, I have watched the show Atlanta and like, there's a couple episodes of Atlanta that are scarier than any movie I've ever seen, period. 
I think I think the Teddy Perkins episode is scarier than any is is the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. Um, and 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 then and after that episode, because Teddy Perkins was, I want to say, first season might have been second season. I can't remember. It's second season. Um, after that Teddy Perkins episode, every episode you watch, you're like, what are they going to do to me here? Like, mm-hmm. like, what kind of scary thing are they going to do? And, you know, um, and I don't know if you've watched the show or not, but there's like, it's, and it's a comedy. That's the thing. The show is largely a comedy, but um, I would say there's like three or four episodes that are so creepy that they, it, 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 it defies the comedy genre that it exists in. And, but that Teddy Perkins episode from season two was so effective that every you watch every episode kind of going, okay, what are they going to do here next? What's going to be like, like they're going to do something to me. They're going to do something to freak me out, you know? Um, and, 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 and that's it. I think maybe we were to a point where even like get out has a, has a nice, I think has some, some good humorous moments in it. Right. And, and us has, has a sense of humor too. I think that some of the, and I think some of the best horror movies of all time, not all of them, but some of them have just enough sense of humor. And I think that if, if this genre is going to evolve, like, and it does have to evolve, right? It has to evolve to be more sophisticated than the society that's informing it. Because I think as a society, we've sort of gone in a lot of ways the opposite of, of evolving we we de-evolved a bit there, there's a lot of of uh philosophical writing on the similarities that horror and humor have as well as what are the ways that they are opponents but still work together right there's the yeah. there's the tempering right the sort of yeah. tension and release and the 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 humor takes some of the edge off um but there's also ways where just sort of playing with physiological arousal, you know, both fear and mirth, right? Uh, the sort of belly laughter are all high physiological arousal in terms of your, um, you know, nervous system, things like that. They're all high. They're, they're, they yeah. look the same, right? Just the um, va- uh, the value, if you will, that we put on those, the, the context, the way that we interpret our, you know, our breathing fast, our high uh, pulse, et cetera. And so you can then, like, like a roller coaster, right? You know, you're tense, you're tense, you're tense, and then you laugh. Yeah. Um, and I'm laughing. And then suddenly, if what if I'm in the middle of laughing, a hatchet comes out and hits someone in the head? Yeah. yeah. Right? My, my <laughs> expectations are violated. I'm yeah. already keyed up. So it, no pun intended, it bleeds over that, that sort of arousal. Um, well, I'll stop there because I'm sure we can go on for about an hour about that. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, this has been a really, I mean, it's been a really great conversation. And um, one of the things that, that I think that, that I'd really like to do before we, before we sign off is, is, is kind of, is kind of ask you, David, you know, what, what's scaring you now? And, um, you know, what, what, what what are the projects that you're working on right now that you most want to want want to share with people? Well, everyday life scares me. You know, it's uh, between the the socio political climate of this nation and then climate change and all these other things are pretty terrifying. The aging process. I've hit this. You know, the, the, I'm at that age now where you know, everybody's like, oh, hey, where'd you get your colonoscopy at? You know, it's, it's, we're comparing notes. <laughs> um, uh, I've got, you know, we're, 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 we're working on a new bitter root arc and, and I'm really pushing the team to take it um, not in a completely new direction, but it's set in a different era. So the original series takes place in the 1920s. This one's taking place in the 1960s. And, and I feel like, you know, talk about a transformative time and talk about the horrors, right? Because that was also like horror changed because America changed because TV and the, the evening news brought the horrors of 
the Vietnam War or the or police attacking children and protesters um, into the living room, right? So, um, so I, I I've thought about you know like okay, how do we explore that with Bitterroot? Um, and you know, but when it comes to outside of Bitterroot, when it comes to horror, like right now, I don't have. I don't have any projects that are that are really pressing to me because um like like I just don't think I can be that scary. I don't think that I can be as scary as as the world is. Now, I do have a book that's coming out next year um and it's not a horror book, but it it, it deals with slavery and and the fight against slavery during the Civil War and in a lot of ways it's a deconstruction and not even a deconstruction, screw that. It's it's more like me taking a hammer to the lost cause narrative, right? It's me taking a hammer and just trying to destroy the idea of both the docile slave, but the noble confederate, right? And and like to me, that's terrifying. Like, like America's love and admiration, and it's continued love and admiration for the Confederacy and for slavery and for all, all the sins that this country is built upon, there's such a significant amount of people who still revere that or, and, and, and just as many who don't even understand what they're revering, right? There's, there's, there's people out there who think Gone with the Wind is the, you know, one of the greatest movies of all time when it's like, no, it's, a, it's an incredible piece of propaganda, right? And, and so much so that you need to, you know, really take apart like how that film came to be. And 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 um and so for me, I'm I'm like not trying to scare anybody in the traditional ways anymore because I don't know if I can. So instead I'm just trying to tell the best stories that I can. And if it gets people um excited or terrified, great. And if not, then so be it. Um yeah, you know, again, I just want to thank you so much for for giving us your time and your thoughts. No, thanks. This is a, it's it's fun having these sort of conversations and 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 I, it really I I do. I spend a lot of time going, you know, um well, what what would be scary right now, right? You know, like like could I do something that, you know, th that that I feel is bringing something more to the equation? and 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 whatever that entertainment equation might be whatever i deem it to be and and um you know i would love to i'd love to make a, a work of horror that that could could sit comfortably with the best but you know that's pretty hard to do and and if i'm get i would you know i would rush, if if i can't make night living dead i don't want to make you know, Friday the Thirteenth, Ten, Jason in Outer Space. Like, right. I, I I don't want to do that. Now, I might look at something like, say, Attack the Block or Shaun of the Dead, or you know, something that's more of a hybrid, um, and go, okay, now maybe that, maybe that I could do. Um, and and because the hybrids in and of themselves are are a challenge. How do you scare somebody and then make them laugh? And if you can do that, you know, you're, you're, you know, if you can do that, you're, you're, you've got something going for yourself. Going back to that sort of virtuoso uh, playing of a symphony of emotions type idea. Yeah. yeah. So, well, thanks for having me guys. And uh, this is, this has been really fun.